Once again, welcome back to the drawing board with me, Stephen Lloyd, and today we'll be talking about the basics of weld design. Now, if you open up your Eurocodes, you'll see that it pretty much recognises four categories of weld. There's a fillet weld where you basically have uh, two connections at right angle, and there is a fillet that uh, fills in the space between those two connected parts. A butt weld, which tends to be the two ends of plate, sometimes end to end, sometimes at an angle. In this case, we're showing a partial penetration butt weld, and you often see this little dob of weld, little filler on the back there to seal the whole uh, joint. The third type is a plug weld, where you'll get a hole or a slot cut in one plate, and then that slot will be filled with weld in order to connect it to a backing plate. And finally, a flare groove weld, which is weld that fills this flared groove between a circular, say a circular hollow section or a round bar and a flat face. But it doesn't really matter what kind of weld you're talking about because all welds have the same basic kind of structure. You have what's called a fusion face which is part of the parent material that you're welding to and you have another fusion face and you have a blob of weld in between that sticks those two together. Now when the weld mixes with the parent material, it actually, it's a molten glob of metal that begins to melt in and it mixes with it and it actually penetrates into some of that parent material. But there is still a gap in the middle, for instance with a fillet weld, that's not connected. So, and we'll stick with the idea of a fillet weld for most of this. Um, it's not really right to imagine the bottom edge of that plate glued to the top edge of that plate, that's not really the way it works. That part in the middle isn't connected and it's better to imagine a model like this where you have two separate plates connected by, let's call them struts of weld material. So in order to work out the strength of that joint, you're working out the strength of these welded struts. Now the first thing you need to know the size of them and that's where we come to throat thickness. And the throat thickness in the Eurocodes is defined as the height of the largest triangle that you can fit inside the shape of that weld. So when you have a concave weld, the height of that triangle is where it touches the inside of that concave shape. Where you have unequal leg lengths, it's at right angles coming off of the, uh, off the weld surface. Where you have a piece of material that isn't necessarily at right angles, you don't have to have a right angled triangle, it can be sort of an isosceles or equilateral triangle, as long as you have a triangle and you measure the height. And where you have a convex shape, where you've got a rounded weld like this, you will have to trim off and pretend that your triangle is only that big, because if you had a bigger triangle it would stick outside of the surface of the weld. So that's your throat thickness, it's the biggest triangle that you can fit inside that weld shape, no matter what that shape is. So coming to the simplified method, you multiply that throat thickness by the strength of the welded material, the shear strength in newtons per square millimetre. And the way that we work out this shear strength is we multiply uh, the ultimate strength by a factor of one over root three. Now, you might recognize this root three factor. It comes in every time we have shear. I call it the root three of shear. Every time that there is shear stress, this root three comes in. If you remember back, there was a drawing board we talked about the Cauchy stress tensor and von Mises yield criterion, and that explains where this root three comes from. So I'm not gonna recap that now, we'll have a little bit of a look of it over this side of the board. So you multiply that uh, ultimate tensile strength of the parent material by a factor of one over root three, and you divide by these two factors here. You have a beta W, which is a correlation factor between the strength of the filler material and the parent material. So when you're using a low grade parent material, say S235, this beta W factor is less than one. So by dividing by something less than one, you're actually making the weld stronger by calculation. So a weld is actually stronger than a weak parent material might suggest. And that's because when you're concentrating stresses around this strut, this weld material is stronger than the parent material and will have a more concentrated stress compared to the parent material around it. So you can actually get away with a little bit more stress than the parent material on its own might suggest. So as you increase the strength of the parent material, this beta W factor becomes closer and closer to 1.0. So when you're using S460, for example, that beta W is 1.0, so it doesn't give you any advantage. The gamma M2, that's the last piece of the puzzle, that's a partial factor, you'll be familiar with those if you're familiar with the Eurocores at all, and for a welded joint that's 
So that's given us the shear strength in newtons per square millimetre, but what we really want is the overall strength of that weld in kilonewtons or newtons. So we multiply that shear strength by the throat thickness and that gives us the strength per length, the strength per millimetre. And then we multiply that by the overall length and that gives us the total strength of that weld. But we can't just use the measured length of a weld, so the effective length is that overall length take away two lots of the throat thickness from either side of the weld. If you have a continuous run of weld all the way around that has no end, then you don't have to take these away. But if you have one straight run of weld that has a distinct start and end, you assume that the weld hasn't quite got to full thickness and therefore full strength for a length of A at either side, and that's equal to the throat thickness. That's the simplified method. That treats every bit of stress that goes through that weld as though it's shear stress. And that's why you apply this root 3 to the whole thing. But we're just going to recap on a little bit of Cauchy stress tensor and von Mises stresses. And this will explain the directional method for weld design, which is slightly more complex, a lot more complex, but will tend to give you a more economical design. It will get you more strength out of the same bit of weld. So in the Cauchy stress tensor, it's a nine part matrix, three by three, and it describes the state of stress at any point in the material in terms of three direct stresses and pairs of shear stresses, which if you know anything about Cauchy stress tensor, you'll find that two one and one two are equal and opposite in order to maintain equilibrium in a rotational sort of plane. So these two are the same, these two are the same, and these two are the same. And when you're looking at von Mises' yield criterion, it comes down to this. The von Mises' stress in this part of the material is half of all of these expressions, and all of that's rooted. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, it's just a quick recap. But what we can do when we're looking at weld is eliminate quite a lot of that equation. We have a direct stress that may be pulling on the weld. We have a shear stress that's cutting across the weld, and we have another shear stress that's going parallel along the weld. So the direct stresses in the other two directions can't exist. We can't have a direct stress across here because there's nothing connected to push or pull it. And anything that's a direct stress that's going parallel along the axis of that weld, well, we've got all this material here, and it doesn't need the weld in order to carry that stress. So we ignore that and any parallel stress going down there is zero. Also, the other shear stress in the third direction, there's, there's no way we can separate this weld in, in that way. It simply can't happen because these two are a solid face here and a solid face here. So we know that that shear stress is zero. So once we put these zeros in, we eliminate most of that, and then that boils down, if we cancel all these expressions out, to this. It's just this equation with everything superfluous to our needs knocked out of it and that is the exact equation that appears in Eurocode 3 part 1 part 8 on the directional method for the design of welds. It's just a reduced down version of the von Mises yield criterion. And it uses the same expression that we had over here with the Fu over beta W gamma M2 except now the root 3 is gone because the root 3 is included in here and it's factored up only on the shear stresses. So the way that this gets more economy out is because this root 3 that was applied to the whole equation in the simplified method is now only applied to the shear stresses and this direct stress here doesn't have to have that three factor applied to it. So you can have more direct stress than you can have shear stress and you'll still be able to carry more of this stress without actually rupturing the weld. There's also an additional check you have to do, which is to make sure that the uh, perpendicular, this direct stress, is less than 0.9 of the ultimate stress of the gamma M factor. So if we look at an example again, sticking to this fillet weld of us pulling up here, if we pulled directly up on this vertical piece of plate, the way that this is resisted is with some shear stresses going in this direction, some direct stresses going in this direction. So you can see that half of what we're dealing with is actually direct stress. So we've got a factor of three missing from half of the stress, which means that we can get a lot more out of this same weld by using this method compared to this method. However, 
it's a lot of effort to check the directional method on every single piece of weld. And what you'll tend to find, especially if you're reading like the engineer's handbook, which will just give you a quartered value for the strength of weld, is they have just used this simplified method, taken a nominal throat thickness, a nominal value of shear strength, divided it by root three, because if you treat everything as shear and you use the simplified method, it will always give you a safe and conservative design of that weld. And it's a lot quicker and easier to do. And let's be honest, it will probably end up being the same size weld because the practicality of welding usually it takes more precedence than the design. So being able to do a six mm fillet weld in one pass rather than asking for a 12 mm which will take two or three passes. I hope that's given you a reasonable understanding of some of the principles behind weld design. Um, so I hope that once again you will join us next time on Back to the Drawing Board. Well, I'm sorry to say that I will no longer be coming back to the drawing board. This has been my final one. I've really enjoyed doing the series and I hope you have too. And I hope you continue to enjoy it because the drawing board will live on in the very capable hands of my successors, Vicky and Elliot. Hi, it's Vicky. And I'm Elliot. Join us next time on Back to the Drawing Board.